Welcome back, everybody. Um, this session is on historic properties. Um, so of the three, if you are, we're hoping to be in parent institutions or auction houses, um, then uh, you, you can find those elsewhere. This is the uh, historic properties and the deaccessioning dilemma uh, panel. Um, so as always, live captioning is available by uh, clicking the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, also, please use the Q&A function to ask your questions. And uh, I want to say a special thanks to our grad student, Alex Mikalski, who is helping out behind the scenes, um, monitoring the questions and, uh, and chat so uh, we get those to our moderator. So I'm very pleased to welcome our moderator, Scott Wands. Scott is the manager of grants and programs at Cum Connecticut Humanities. Um, where he oversees the C C Connecticut Humanities Fund granting program and delivers non-grant funded services to Connecticut's cultural uh, community. Um, welcome, Scott, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Emily, uh, and thanks to everyone at Syracuse uh, University for hosting this fabulous two-day symposium. I hope everyone that's attending our session has been able to uh, attend some of the other wonderful sessions that have been happening over the last uh, now day and a half. Um, I also want to thank uh, Alex, who will be working behind the scenes on this session today, uh, helping to get questions from you all. So please do um, use the Q&A function to pose questions that you want to ask uh, of our panel. We're going to try to get to as many of them as possible throughout the session. Um, and I know we're not going to be able to get them all uh, with the number of people that are here, but we're going to do our best. Um, just a brief few words about what the session is. We've talked a lot about deaccessioning over the last day and a half but a different type of institution, art museums, uh, natural history museums, even history museums are different than historic structures and historic structures that have landscapes. So we wanna get into a little bit about what these sites are, what kind of things they care for, um, and especially what kind of issues that deaccessioning will bring up that are different from all the other content we've talked about at the session here. Um, you know, should a historic site treat its building as an object? Um, how do we balance building maintenance with preservation? What policies and practices are specifically geared to managing historic stri uh, structures and landscapes? How can we continue to preserve a property once we've decided to deaccession it? And you know, one of the questions that's all too important today, how has the pandemic really started to change the conversation? Uh, those are some of the issues and many more that we wanna talk about today with you all. Uh, but first, I do want to introduce the panel that will be talking uh, with us all. Um, first off, I want to introduce Christy S. Coleman. Christy is the Executive Director of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation and has served as the Chief Executive Officer of some of the nation's most prominent museums. Christy, thank you for, for joining us today. Thank um, you for having me. Next up, I want to introduce uh, Lawrence J. Yurden. Uh, Larry is the President and the CEO of Strawberry Bank Museum. Uh, a living history museum in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Good morning, Larry. Good morning, great to be here. And also we have Ken Torino. Ken is the manager of community partnerships and resource development at Historic New England, which is the oldest and largest regional heritage organization in the United States. Ken was also a member of the AAM Task Force on Direct Care of Collections, and we'll be talking to him a little bit about that as we go on. Good morning, Ken. Morning, Scott. Well. First up, I want to ask each of you just to give the, the audience who may not know each of your institutions just a little bit of background about what it is, the historic structures and landscapes that you care for, um, and just a little bit more background on, on, on the historic structures that are going to be, um, you know, you're going to be bringing into the discussion today. So, uh, Ken, let's start off with you. What, what's, what's historic New England? Sure. Briefly, uh, we own 38 historic properties and landscapes. Um, in five of the six New England states, we're working on Vermont. Uh, we have an office there. We also have over uh, 100,000 objects in our collection, about 50,000 within the houses, another 50,000 in our collection storage facility. 
um, and about a million in our library and archives. Um, and uh, in addition to that, I'm also a board member at Historic House, um, which is dealing with a lot of the issues that we'll be talking about, uh, Vice President of the House of Seven Gables in Salem, Massachusetts. Wonderful. Chrissy, tell us a little about Jamestown, Yorktown. Well, first of all, the Jamestown, Yorktown Foundation is actually a, a place of recreated structures. So we don't have original structures at our site, but we do have a wealth of um, historic artifacts, books, ephemera, et cetera. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of deaccessioning, but I'll also talk about, since we're talking about sites and structures, in my prior role, I was CEO of the American Civil War Museum, where the entire site was, in fact, uh, a historic place of the historic iron, Tredder, Tredegar Iron Works. And so there were some very unique um, situations there with five original structures that were operating as museum facilities. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Strawberry Bank, Larry, what, what is Strawberry Bank in New Hampshire? Strawberry Bank's an outdoor living history museum that sits in the middle of uh, the lovely little seacoast town of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It's 10 acres. We have 39 buildings on the site. Of those 39 buildings, all of them but three are original to the site, sit on their own, their original foundations. And the story we tell is the whole 400 years of, of uh, settlement on this particular property. So we go back to start in the late 17th century and run up to uh, 1960 or later. And um, so it's a, it's a variety of, of buildings. At one point, we did have a number of offsite buildings as well, and we'll address those. Sure, so I think the first question I wanna ask us all is what's in the, the, the description for the session today? How is a historic site and landscape, because we have to remember it's not just the historic structure, but the, the uh, land around it. How is caring for a historic structure and a landscape different from some of the other um, types of content we've talked about from art museum collections to natural history collections? Now, I think it's been I, difficult. I was gonna say, I think it's been difficult for the community and the leadership, uh, volunteer leadership within organizations to understand buildings as collections or property for that. And, and that's probably the most difficult <laughs> is the real estate, the land that the uh, buildings sit on is also an object, part of that collection. So when you're dealing with questions on what to do with properties, uh, that's the first part of the education. You have to kind of uh, make sure it happens. And, and Scott, I don't think a lot of sites in the past have thought about uh, their historic buildings as necessarily part of their collections. We accession them at Historic New England. Uh, the National Trust uh, for Historic Preservation accessions their buildings as part of the collection. Um, they're central to our collections. But also, as you mentioned, Scott, the landscape. And I think a lot of places in the past have, have put less emphasis on that but it's part of the whole package of interpretation and, and the reason why we preserve these properties. And it's basically to serve the public. And I was enjoying in the conversations yesterday, people talking about, you know, it's not only about the caring, it's about the sharing. It's, we're here to serve the public. As a third point of view, I would say that most institutions, historic, uh, historic museums and sites that um, are out there certainly um, uh, list their historic properties as assets, but they may or may not list them as an artifact, as a part of their collections. I know that as, as, as you've heard, some do, but the majority don't for a series of reasons. First of all, um, there is a presumption that if you are holding the property as part of your collection, then you may not alter it. And so if you're talking about a building or a structure at, that you want guests to go through or you're conducting tours or you have original um, furnishings and the like in them, it makes it a little bit more difficult to take care of it um, from a building maintenance perspective. It makes it a tad more difficult in some cases, depending on where you live, 
to do things like upgrades to HVAC systems or even installing HVAC systems in some of those properties. Because again, you are fundamentally altering that collection. And that's something that we tend not to want to do when we're, you know, if you're talking about a book, you wouldn't fundamentally change the book by changing its cover. Well, when it comes to, to buildings, that is often what you have to do if you're going to really preserve them. Um, and so that push-pull between preservation and building maintenance, I think each institution looks at that in a slightly different way to ensure that they're providing safe um, spaces for people to go through, um, but at the same time, making sure that they can, in fact, um, take care of the sort of the, the multiplicity of what needs to happen. And, and, and honestly, again, I think it varies greatly by state. Um, some states are far stricter about uh, what they allow to happen to historic properties versus others. So I'll just stop there because again, that's one of the realities that we deal with at, at historic museums and sites. And, this and Scott, is oh, I just want to jump in real quickly because we've been very specific so far talking about, kind of talking about historic houses, but let's not forget um, but you should make a point. There are more historic houses than there are McDonald's. There are more historic houses than there are Starbucks. And you know those are on every corner. But let's not forget about the historical societies uh, that almost every town has. Often those are located in historic buildings too. But they're not necessarily treated um, as museum collections. They're housing the collections, the artifacts. So there's a couple couple different ways, as Christy was saying, of looking at this. You're, you're spot on, Ken. And I mean, every community might not have something that they call a museum outright, but almost every community has one, if not multiple, historic houses, historic structures, um, things that, that tie back to the past of, of, of significant interest. Um, and as Christy's saying, you know, the big question is, do you consider your structure, when it's a structure, to be a collections item? And this gets into some of the work that the field has been doing over the last few years to talk about capitalization of collections and ethics. And Ken, I'm gonna turn it over to you because you, you served on the AAM task force as, as a board member for ASLH and, and kind of worked through that. So what, why did this work happen in 2016 and what were some of the big um, discussion points that, that that committee had? Well, there was a great discussion earlier today that uh, with Sally Yurkovich who um, aptly chaired that committee. And it, there were a lot of disparate voices on that committee. Um, and a lot of it centered around um, what does direct care actually mean? Um, and that's still something that's going on today. Um, the committee, um, again, that brought, as you said, Scott, people from natural history, it brought people from zoos, aquariums, as well as art museums and history museums. And, uh, Bert Logan, uh, who runs Ohio History Connection, and I were kind of like, we were the history guys. And uh, we all had some different interests and, and thoughts. Um, the art museum directors um, were really adamant that the um, deaccession monies from art could only be used for purchasing other art. Um, there were others, those of us in the history museums, uh, who very felt very strongly that um, when I'm deaccessioning one of the 20 spinning wheels that I had at my historic site when I was a director, I did not need 20 spinning wheels, um, that I was using the money to buy the acid-free boxes and materials that I needed to care for the rest of the collection. To me, that was clear and simple. So the uh, AAM committee and the white paper decided not to specifically define direct care. But uh, we did uh, come up with uh, some guidelines. And basically, the, the decision was to leave it up to each museum to uh, decide what they meant in their policies. And it had to be written in policies for direct care. So allowing them. Now, we still get guidance from AAM. And we get guidance from the American Association for State and Local History. And you know it, takes a few things off the table, but it, there's an awful lot of freedom there. You know, I thought one of the good things that Sally came up with in the um, paper for AAM was a, a matrix 
to help you at your individual site decide, you know, what's in the gray area, what, what is at, what is definitely direct care and what is definitely, are, are staff salaries direct care? So that was a lot of what our discussion was. And again, the decision was to basically leave it up to the individual sites to determine what direct care meant to them. So this is something that AAM and ASLH are, are leaving up in large part to the institution. But you know, the first question I'm seeing coming in here kind of gets right at this. And Larry, I want to ask you, so how do you prioritize the use of funds, especially when it comes from deaccessioning, between the preservation and upkeep of a building versus the conservation and storage or staffing and other issues that, that Ken just brought up? Good question. Uh, <laughs> It's a complex question. Of course, here at Strawberry Bank, we make it more complex by the fact that 39 buildings, <clears throat> many of them are used as commercial spaces, are part of our rental program called the Heritage House Program. So in those 39 buildings, we have 32 office spaces and a dozen uh, residences. So, and, they're, and most of the time they're combined the buildings. So you've got museum, activities going on while you've got also the rental program going on. The rental program generates for us over half a million dollars a year, which gives us, uh, we take a percentage of that and set it aside. And that gives us some opportunity to address the day-to-day the -day maintenance that was referenced early. So we have a fund to actually deal with those issues. The larger issues, if you have to restore a building or do large repairs, that money is usually raised separately through grants or foundations or individual donors. We have some donors who are very keen on preservation and so will uh, be a source for that, that necessary money. Larry, talk just a little bit more about that program because that's not one that you're here, that's one that you set up after you became director of Strawberry Bank. So tell us a little bit about the situation that you inherited and, and, and why that program um, became a solution for you. Yeah, we, as I mentioned, we had 39 buildings and they were, uh, and that's a lot of building to take care of, particularly in the climate that we exist in here right on the coast. Um, <clears throat> and so we were looking at the buildings and there was quite a bit of space that was either underutilized or used for storage. Ken referenced his 20 spinning wheels. I looked in one of the buildings one day, inspected it. We had exhibitions that had been taken apart and that were sitting there for 20 years and broken tables and chairs and looms and spinning wheels. And it really didn't seem to be a very good use of a early, uh, late 18th century building. So that was one of our first projects. And the idea was to use the underutilized space, not to impact the museum uh, buildings or the museum's presentation or program, but rather to take those underutilized or not used spaces and convert them to rental spaces. Now, it does come up with some problems in the, and we solved that, I think, by having a very clear arrangement in the lease with people on what the expectations are of both living in a historic building and also living on the, in the middle of the campus of a historic site. So uh, that's worked out quite well for us. But that's a little bit different than what historic New England does with some of its properties that you're not interpreting as museums. So talk a little bit more about what historic New England's uh, practices are in this area. Well, the, th um, the thing I really wanted to mention, Scott, was that we've established, and I didn't mention this earlier, um, an easement program or stewardship program. And these are houses that we now have 116 in that program. They are privately owned. But we were at the point, and Larry can appreciate this and probably Christy too, where at one point uh, we had too many historic houses. Uh, they were, it was not sustainable. <clears throat> so we did a massive deaccession um, and we deaccessioned 30 something historic properties. Um, some were, were rentals and some were operating as historic house museums. And we put them to found our easement program or stewardship program. And I'll put a link in uh, for everyone about that program. And as I said, now we're up to 116 properties. And what happens there is 
the um, properties have in the deed specifying what things can or can, what things cannot be changed, what things have to be preserved. And I think that that is really important. So that was the core, us deaccessioning. But now we take these in from private owners who really want to see their house preserved. Um, and the easements will stay in perpetuity. Many states have this program. The National Trust has a program. Um, and I think it's, it's very viable for even museums who want to deaccession to put them in. Now, Larry, you did that on your own, correct? Right. Right, we had three buildings. We had three buildings that we uh, deaccessioned. Yes, and and, uh, and really, the, the issue really was we were not taking care of those buildings. They were not vital to the museum's function, and at that point, it was financially much uh, much more appropriate that they they uh, we we deaccessioned them. Now we did that, and there one one of the buildings we owned directly. Two of them were in trust, in dealing with the courts, and we had to get out of the trust. Uh, and working with the with the courts, the the income from the two buildings that were in trust went into an endowment, which supports the restoration and preservation of the buildings on the campus. The third was an outright sale where we could use the cash and we used that cash actually to restore one of the buildings on the campus. Now, that's one big difference between selling an institution's Pollock and, and selling a house. You have the ability to, to maybe sell it with these mints and still have some control. And like, you can't tell the owner who buys the Pollock where they can hang and what they can and can't do with it. But there are other things that are interesting with deaccessioning from historic houses from under the roof itself. Um, a lot of times places are interpreting life in that house. And there's kind of a third path between outright collections use and all of the collections care and policies and procedures you have to follow or deaccessioning and losing complete control of. And that's an educational collection. And I wanna ask Christy to talk a little about what that third path is and, and why you might wanna deaccession some items but make them teaching tools. Right. Well, one of the one of the primary reasons that that can happen is if, for example, that item um, that's being deaccessioned is not as tightly tied to your collections policy anymore. If there's been a change in the collections policy, um, for example, I'll, I'll, uh, a colleague of ours at uh, Valentine Museum three years ago um, decided to refine its collection scope because there was a period of time when they were collecting anything from anybody that might have had something to do with Richmond, which meant they had, they were bursting at the seams, even in their external site. So what, and, and one of the other big problems that they had, which many of us, and in, in especially at historic sites, I don't think this is as much as an issue at art museums, but one of the often problems is we have something referred to as permanent long-term loans. <laughs> where the institution doesn't outright own it. Um, the family gave it on this permanent loan status and it has been generations and nobody knows who the descendants are um, to, to do anything with it. And, and those items may no longer be. So what the Valentine decided to do is to make an, a list of all of these items that needed to be deaccessioned. And they started with those items that were um, a part of their long-term loan program or permanent loan program. And they, they treated it uh, under Virginia law, they treated it as unclaimed property. And they did that first. So they put it out, you know, put out the required legal notices of unclaimed property in a variety of publications. Um, they waited the specific amount of time um, they put the notices out again, tried, you know, internally tried to find where descendants might be. And uh, after the, the given point of time, they either brought those things in uh, as now something that they could, in fact, fully accession if they wanted to keep it. And those items that they wanted to deaccession because there was, you know, 25 spinning wheels, uh, they decided that they would get, you know, uh, uh, sell off those items. Um, and, and that's what they did. And it, and it proved to be that culling of the collection um, proved to be highly valuable to them because it did provide them the resources that they needed for ongoing collections care. And as they defined it, um, it was not only, uh, there was a percentage of curatorial time, but it was also curatorial facilities 
that could be upgraded with that funding. And um, another, and I, and I think that that was probably one of the most clever ways I've heard of, of deaccessioning those items. Now the teaching element, um, again, a lot of institutions, once they go through that call process, will deaccession an item, but keep it to be a part of a teaching uh, collection where museum educators are able to use that object, take them into the classrooms, and and you know still providing a certain level of care, but it is no longer an accessioned piece, but it is still an artifact that can be shared more widely, that can be handled, etc. But there is no, uh, there isn't as much of a deep concern that we're going to lose uh, a significant historical asset if something happens to it, right? And so those are some of the other options that, that come on, on the plate. Uh, I will say that um, given the, the environment that we've all had to contend with over the past year with the uh, COVID closures and the threat that many, very real threat that many museums have had, this conversation about um, selling collections uh, to, to raise operating funds is a really interesting one. And I think that um, some of the rigidity <clears throat> that the field had around that uh, has lessened um, because at the end of the day, if you can't operate your institution, you can't care for a collection is, is sort of the last straw. And yes. that also obviously raises questions around for those institutions that have them, you know, what happens to cash reserves or what happens to, to um, uh, uh, endowments and things like that, or the corpus of an endowment when you were facing a crisis like that. Um, and like, like I said, like many of, of our institutions have in the past year. So there's a lot there. There's a lot there. So that brings up an interesting discussion. We had this a little bit in the, in the pre, uh, prelude to this. If you're a historic site and you have art, oftentimes the most valuable object that you have is that painting or that piece of art. So ethically, if you are in the situation that Christy's describing and so many other places are facing right now, do you sell your most expensive item to keep the collection alive? And I know Ken has some, some very strong thoughts. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it to Ken first here. Well, well, you know, I, I do. And, you know, with the National Trust policy uh, really, and I put this, I put a number of links in the chat, so I'm going to send people there, our easement program, but also the National Trust Policy, was very careful because I think they realized this, that a lot, as you said, Scott, is what is valuable is the art, the most monetarily valuable. And organizations have in the past cherry-picked, and the National Trust used that word, they wanted to avoid that. And you look at sites, um, and it didn't get the outrage of when the same outrage that the Berkshire Museum got when it was selling its artworks to survive. But places like um, the, to, to name names, the Edsel and Eleanor Ford House, uh, which sold their Cezanne off the wall for $100 million when they already had a $60 million uh, operating endowment, um, I, I, I don't go along with. Uh, they did not, in my mind, need the money. Uh, they say that they are not a museum, but they are actually an operating uh, foundation. Um, okay. Um, they've actually, just this past summer, put the other uh, Cezanne on the market. I don't know if it's actually sold yet at auction. Wow. Um, so, and it went to a private collector. It didn't go even to auction where a public institution could buy it. Now, to me, that's wrong. Same, you know, and there are other instances, the Seward House in New York, and um, I think the people in Syracuse probably know this story because I know they've done some work there, um, trying to sell the Thomas Cole painting. Um, and they put up um, you know, reproduction, a good reproduction. Um, you know, would the, uh, you know, would the museum selling this great art put up a reproduction of the Pollock that was being sold in Syracuse? No, no. These, these objects are integral to that house and I am really opposed to doing that. If a house is 
in a historic site is in danger of closing, or if it's in their policy that you know they need to repair their roof, and they're deaccessioning twenty of their fifty spinning wheels. It's not going to bring in a lot of money, believe me. I've done it. Um, could they use that money towards the roof? In my mind, yes, because that's protecting the the whole envelope of the site. And we had these debates with AAM too. I, I really do think our historic sites are different from the art museums, but I feel really strongly you shouldn't be cherry picking the collection. But, but there are two. But there are two question, questions there. I'm sorry, I hear an echo there. Um, it's it's the use of the money. So if you're going to take an asset and sell an asset, an art, artifact, or house, building, whatever. And then you either buy another asset or do direct care on that asset. That's one thing. But if you sell that and use, use the money to pay the oil bill or the gas bill or the electric bill, that's a different question. And it's not one that I necessarily disagree with because the object, as Christy said, is, it really is keeping the doors open. And uh, so if you have to sell something to keep the doors open, uh, my outlook on that is, is, uh, is much different. And, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that, but when you're talking about selling a painting for $100 million because you can, and it's going right. to a general operating fund endowment, that's, that's not good. Yeah, if you don't need to do it, you shouldn't be doing it. Right, right, exactly. But it came up in these discussions that, in other discussions as part of this conference, that you know, a lot of the board thinks, you know, well, you know, sell the art, you know, <laughs> it's worth a lot of money, you know, you can put up a reproduction. Christy, I want to I want to bring you in to, to respond to to Ken and Larry's thoughts here, but also, you know, we've talked a lot over the last day and a half about deaccessioning to try to become more relevant with today to, to meet your community's needs more. Um, you know, we're talking about historic structures. These are places that may have come with a very limited scope of, of collections because that's what the family that lived in that house had. Well, what, what, what about trying to deaccession your collection to start to meet your new mission or your, your new community needs? Um, what are your thoughts on, on, on deaccession for that purpose through a historic site? I think that that is absolutely appropriate. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that, uh, one of the great reckonings of, of the past decade, if not more, is just how unbalanced some of our collections are and what we consider historic or worthy of collection, and they have predominantly been highly Eurocentric. And so um, great homes and structures of, for example, civil rights leaders, um, both of the modern civil rights era or the post-reconstruction era or or before, those sites and structures often have been destroyed. Um, and, and so institutions have been looking very carefully at their collections and where, if they can't raise the money outright, um, because that's the really interesting thing, is that um, with the scope of donors that most of our institutions have, their interest in those things are limited. Even though the stories themselves are highly valuable for a more complete American narrative, and so they may find themselves in a situation where they have to deaccession something in order to acquire something else. So what we end up, what we what we have in the American landscape, I will be very clear with you, is that I mean, especially here in, in in the South, we have all of these homes that were deemed these plantation sites and what have you that were deemed extraordinary, you know, historic sites and grand examples of Gothic architecture or what have you, and. Um, all of the slave quarters or supporting structures were deliberately destroyed, torn down or whatever, or left to rot. And now we understand, and, and many people begin to think of these places as, um, uh, you know, they are, they're forced labor camps, they're you know, these slavery institutions. And so a lot of archeology span is going into these sites and they end up reconstructing a lot of these buildings. Well, you know, that has cost, right? And like I said, the, until there is a greater balance and or appreciation of the amount of capital that is needed to raise to support these, these types of um, things that help us understand um, our, our history a lot better, then it becomes problematic. Um, 
And since I'm talking about those types of sites, I mean, uh, uh, at the Jamestown, Yorktown Foundation, as I said, we are adjacent to the original location of the English settlement at Jamestown. Um, but we, the land that we occupy along that entire uh, scope uh, of that area at one point in time was a, a part of various uh, uh, towns that were of Powhatan confederated indigenous peoples are also on those lands. And so, you know, so we have this, this, this kind of push pull and, and this is where the land piece comes into play um, about the desire to try to maintain or to save as much of this land as possible, even if nothing is ever done with it. And, um, and, and that is our, our case at, at, um, at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. We have adjacent properties that um, we own, um, that there are no plans to ever develop them because they haven't been properly excavated. Um, and it enables us you know, an opportunity later on to partner with National Park, who is ongoing um, excavations as well as uh, uh, discovery, um, rediscovery Jamestown, the archeology span um, program. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I am a big proponent of you know, if you need to sell it to swap it out to balance that collection, do what you got to do. Um, fortunately enough, I have, I can say, I have not been in that situation. Um, whenever I have had to make the call out for the artifact or uh, the needs and, and wanting to know if, if things exist, um, folks generally have been able to come forward or point me in the direction of what we need. And we've been able to raise that, that, those funds to do that. Um, I acknowledge that's a pretty rare space to be able to do that, um, but it is, you know, it 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 is absolutely something that works. Um, if I I don't want to go off script because I know Scott, you've probably got a, a ton of. Oop, you you gone on mute. You just went mute. I'm sorry. I did notice that um, one of the questions was in fact about, you know, what do you think about. Um, uh, renting land and property uh, that may have been uh, a, a plantation site or, or what have you. And we really need the money and we can't afford not to do these types of, uh, of events, you know, weddings or whatever um, at those sites. And that has become a highly controversial uh, thing. And um, I think that, you know, in, in that particular case, you have to very carefully consider um, what you are saying to a community when you, when you, on one hand, say that you acknowledge um, the pain and suffering of a place, but, you know, come on and still have your wedding there. I think, I think you have to be very mindful of what that could, in fact, do to a community's trust in what you're doing when something, you know, because let's face it, um, public sentiment will change. That is the nature of the beast of our business if, if we are in the history business. Um, you know, history has never been for the dead. It is always for the living and the questions that they are asking and the situations they are trying to navigate and drawing upon the past to help them figure out. So it's going to always change. And if the sentiment has changed, um, it seems to me that museums need to be and historic sites and properties and real estate and whatever else need to be equally as flexible to understand that with that change may require um, different approaches and a re-examination of our ethos. So there's a few questions that have come in in the chat here, and I do want to get to those here. So one that kind of is, is most relevant to the discussion we're currently having here regards organizations, as, as Chrissy was talking about, that are, are mainly Eurocentric in terms of their holdings right now, um, and wanting to know what institutions should be thinking about or is it is you know, considerations they should be making when they want to um, have more uh, artifacts that are from uh, from black artists or that are uh, there to tell the story of the enslaved individuals who lived at the house when objects related to them may have long since been um, taken out of the house or, or never uh, were, were kept by the family um, are reproductions appropriate so how how do we start to deal with the fact that we realize that our houses have histories that may not have been told in many 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 moons they may be uncomfortable histories what about deaccessioning to try to tell that story how, how what do we have to think about 
Ken, I think you want to jump in here, so I'm going to turn it to you. Right. Um, well, what I want to—a couple of things I want to say, Scott. One is that um, this got brought up in another another session, and I want to people to think very carefully about what their collections are um, and what they should be. And if you're not familiar with active collections, Trevor Jones, Rainy Tisdale, Ely Woods, I'm putting that link to their website up, you need to. And it talks about, you know, what you, how you have to look at your collections. What is the public good? You know, those that aren't serving your needs should be deaccessioned. But on the other side, so please look at that if you're not familiar with it. But on the other side is, and I can tell you this from historic New England, um, is that we are being very, very careful what we're taking into the collections now these days because let's face it and this came up in other sessions everything we take into our collections it costs us money to take to care for we have to we know that and it does and so we're at historic going and being very very careful about what's being offered to us i'll give you a quick example 25 years ago when my mother passed away uh the smithsonian national museum of american history came to boston and took a, some of her costume jewelry and clothing. I still had a lot left. I came to work for Historic New England. I offered it to them. They said, you know, well, where's the photo of her wearing it? And they're like, well, I don't have any. They're, well, we can't take any. We have to have the documentation these days. We're being very, very particular about what we're taking, but also we're making, we're putting the efforts into collecting the things that we didn't have, that we don't have in the past. We are trying to be more inclusive. You know, basically those houses I told you about were pretty much dead rich white guys' houses, maybe a woman um, thrown in there. And we're, but the houses themselves, and this is getting away from deaccessioning, but we're now looking at the houses. What can, what can we use in those houses to tell these stories? Where did the money come from to build these houses? Where, who, you know, who harvested the mahogany for, this chest on frame that we have in the collection. You know, slave labor in the Caribbean. Where do these people make their money? Who were their servants? We're discovering stories that we didn't even know that we had. And that's what we can do. We can still use the collections we have, I think, at our historic sites to tell that. But we at Historic New England are more than just our houses. So we're collecting broadly. That's why we want these other materials um, to come into collection. So that's becoming our focus now. And I know Larry's bringing on a new building to tell stories at his site that he's not, uh, that they've not been able to tell before. Right, Larry? You want to talk a little yes, about that? that is <laughs> true. <laughs> um, I just, to, to Christy's point, I do see there, there has been a move in the field, just the beginning. But there, there, there has been a move uh, in terms of telling the story more broadly, um, which has been gratifying to see. Um, Strawberry Bank worked with the New Hampshire Black Heritage Trail and uh, worked uh, putting up a number of bronze plaques on buildings that associated with stories of, of people of color and that experience over time, but it really wasn't very satisfying to look at a plaque. It's, you know, it's too, too restrictive, not enough information. Um, so we began to look a little deeper and this neighborhood really was sitting on the, on the edge of what was the black enclave for Portsmouth. And uh, as we look closer, we found in fact, there were buildings that were occupied by black families so fortunately, uh, we were able to, to round up enough money and a big chunk of that came from NEH, God bless them, and, uh, and some donors that have stepped forward. But we're gonna be able to tell the story of a family who lived here in 1948 and were involved with civil rights movement and, and very involved with the community. Um, but I, uh, to the point I just want to make is uh, being really being an old white guy as I am, uh, I thought I was going to tell the story. And it took me a while to figure out that I needed the assistance of the Black History Trail family uh, and scholar family of scholars and colleagues to, to actually tell that story here at Strawberry Bank. 
so it was a learning lesson for me that doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about today but uh it was uh it was important to me there are and if i can add one last point on this one on, on the subject of of use of artifact and where do you find it and can you be a session to get the pieces that you want i would also tell you that um, you need to take a second look at, as, as, as Ken was suggesting, take a second look at what's in your collection. Too often when we talk about collections, we're talking about who made them, when, where, how, what's it made out of, when did it come, when did they wear it, da 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 And, what, um, and I'll give a perfect example. We, when, I, when I was at the American Civil War Museum and we were building our new exhibition of People's Contest, one of the concerns that we had as we were going into that is that the bulk of our collection, because we were an institution that was formed from a merger um, uh, that included the Museum of the Confederacy uh, and their wealth of extraordinary uh, collection, the concern was that, that the collections about African-American uh, African -American presence in, in, as well as United States federal troops was not going to be, was going to be overwhelmed by that collection. Um, as we looked more carefully at it, what we found, and I'll give you a real simple example. In 1904 and 1905, the U.S. War Department, um, predecessor to the Department of Defense, the U.S. War Department gave to the Museum of the Confederacy over 350 captured Confederate battle flags. And when we went back and looked at the history of those regiments that had had their flag captured, we found a whole nother set of stories. And part of that was several of the flags that, that were captured were captured at Petersburg by United States colored troops, which ended up matching up with collections that we already had in possession of those black troops at Petersburg. And we were able to, to now show this Confederate battle flag in the section on, you know, in that portion of the story um, about the USCT. Um, when it came to the China set that was in what became known as the White House of the Confederacy, the residence where Jefferson Davis and his family lived, there were, a, there were several sets of China. And as we, again, looked more carefully at that, you know, we knew it was manufactured in Europe and it had been brought over. But what we, what we learned from that is we could use um, that tea set, for example, um, to talk about Mary Elizabeth Bowser, the free black woman who passed herself off as an enslaved, for, a slave woman for hire in the White House of the Confederacy who was actually there as a spy, a networked spy. Um, and in the White House of the Confederacy, this woman was, you know, along with uh, uh, several others, uh, were able to smuggle information out of Jefferson Davis's White House directly to Grant on a regular basis. And we were able to tell that story through this teacup, right? So the point is when you, it, it's, it's really like taking the grand advice that Fred Wilson gave us back in the nineties and his mining the museum. You have to be able to look very carefully at your collection with a different lens. And when you do that, you will find that you may have far more than you anticipated if you are willing to pivot just enough. And so right. I would say you need to be able to do that before you even start deaccessioning. Um, and that's where I think, honestly, too many of our young curators coming out, uh, out and many of them already in the field have no concept of how to do that. And, and uh, that's something that, that many of us are strongly encouraging to teach them how to look and to think and to ask very different questions of the things that are already in collection that in fact can tell those stories uh, uh, through a material culture. No, and that's such an important point. Yeah. Some, you know, I, I have a background in material culture from the Winterthur program and, and connoisseurship and understanding how something was made is important, but the whole context of, of, of this object and, and how it connects to a community and how that changes over time that's where the, the power is. And I think where the, the, the field is going more, more and more, not just looking at something for its beauty, but for its impact and the stories that it tells. Um, one, I know we got a lot of questions here that I want to get to, but I want to kind of flip the timeline here because we've gone on the problems from one side of the timeline where you inherit stuff that doesn't tell all the stories you want to tell now. But with historic structures, it literally can be the kind of thing where it was someone's house yesterday 
they pass away, unfortunately, it had been willed to an institution, tomorrow, all of a sudden, you have another building. You have a building where there could be laundry in the dryer, food in the fridge, and you now have to figure out what do we accession, what do we deaccession. And Ken, I want to turn this over to you because I know you've got a great story that, that you can share and some, some friends that came along with the house as well. Yeah, I think some people know this story. I mean, what the, the, the thing is, um, I, I want to point out is that an organization like Historic New England has a very detailed and I think great uh, policy on accepting any property into its fold. So accessioning. Uh, which I also think is actually good for looking at, at deaccessioning. Uh, we basically don't take a property unless it comes with, you know, integral collections and some kind of money and endowment with it. Um, I have given this document and I'll put a link into it. It's in the book Max and I just did in 2019 reimagining historic houses. There's a chapter that refers to this. Um, I've given it to people to look at about deaccessioning properties. Um, but Scott's talking about a property um, that I was on the board of a historic house that had never had running water, never had electricity, never had any heat source other than the original fireplace built in the 1790s. And the donor wanted it to become a museum resort to its early 18th century appearance. Um, unfortunately, the building wasn't built until the late 18th century, so that would be tearing it down when we go back to forest, but we didn't do that. Um, house was filled with material. So the board struggled, you know, should this be a house museum? Should this be accessioned? Um, and the decision after 10 long years and why I have gray here um, is that the answer was, was no. And the day I came on the board, there had been a study that was done previous to that that said, this is not a good candidate for a historic house because it does not have a compelling story. And our objects have to have compelling stories. Go again to active collections, because if they don't, those are good candidates for deaccessioning. Um, and the decision was that we would not accession it, but we would put it the house in an easement program. Um, and that went into historic New England. So we have the attorney general from two states involved, all above the board, because I had worked, I was working with historic New England. But the collection, Scott, and this was really interesting. Um, there was a house and barn, and people said the barn was only standing up because the collections filled it all three stories. It was absolutely jam-packed. So we acted as if the, the collection was accession. And we decided that we were going to offer, in keeping with the, the gist of the donor's will to make the house a museum, any of the collections to appropriate institutions. So we actually hired two guest curators and we invited area museums, including Larry Strawberry Bank, uh, because it was in Exeter, New Hampshire. Um, and we invited Historic New England. We invited the local Exeter Historical Society, New Hampshire Farm Museum, and so on and so on. And curators came in and they basically submitted a list that the guest curators, if there was any object that two or more museums wanted that they would decide. Do you know of the thousands of artifacts, 1% were chosen for collections at other institutions? That was it. That was all they wanted. I think it's a good thing people are being more. And we did not differentiate, Christy, because some people wanted these objects for educational um, use, for their educational collection. And we said, go to it, because the the donor wanted these things to be used to serve the public. There they are, that's fine. So we gave that material away and then we sold the rest. And you know what we did with the money? We gave it to the institutions because as I said earlier, it costs us to take care of this. So we divided up the money from the sale and what was left over from the sale of the house and distributed among the several institutions that had taken objects to help support them in the future. So, oh, oh, but I didn't tell the best part. Sorry, Scott. Um, the, the woman who donated this um, gave the house to be a museum, but no money. But she left her other house to her 12 cats and they had life tenancy of the other house. And only when they died 
could we use the money from that other house and the money that was in trust for the cats towards the museum. So we desperately tried to deaccession the, the cats <laughs> and people gave us all sorts of formulas how to do that. Um, but it did, <laughs> but we did not, we actually ended up buying a cat condo, seriously, uh, for the, the remaining, by that time there were six. So that's my, my uh, cat story. So if anyone okay. who's on today's Zoom uh, ends up inheriting cats, Ken is the person to talk to. He, he can at least, at least a, a sympathetic ear, if not have some suggestions on how to deal with life tenancy for cats. Um, one question that came recently here, uh, and we, we dealt with this a little bit, but um, they want the, the panelists to share their thoughts on tiered collections, um, why you might want to create tiers to address issues of various storage conditions um, and depending on location. So um, let, me, Larry, let me start off with you. What, what are your thoughts on having a tiered kind of collections policy? I, and you're gonna have to tell me what a tiered collections policy is. So if I'm understanding the question correctly here, they want to know about um, I think you know, things like education collections, oh, um, yeah. grade out uh, collections issues, how it deals with collection storage. Yeah, we're fortunate at, at Strawberry Bank uh, for the size of this institution, we do have a collection center. And uh, that was, we had a collection center in an older building in Portsmouth and we're able to sell that off at the height of the, well, the then height of the real estate market. We're having currently another bubble here, but, um, and so we built a building, but I think we look at our collections, those collections that can go out and be used for exhibition uh, and, and be loaned in some cases. And then there's a collection which is too delicate, really is there for study purposes and preservation. And then we do have an educational collection, uh, which is made up of both reproduction and original materials that and uh, are used for educational programs and are more hands-on kind of things. And as Christy said, I think that, that those, that education collection also puts some restrictions on how you use that material. Some of it's, uh, some of it's fairly free and hands-on and, and can be used quite easily and liberally. Other things have a little, take a little bit more care. We have another very practical question here that was asking, we talked about the difference between preservation and building maintenance. We wanna know if we've got some good examples about what the distinctions might, might be for folks that are, are having area, uh, difficulty figuring out the gray area there. What would be preservation? What would be building maintenance? And what would be the policies that we'd wanna be enacting to help us distinguish between these kind of issues? You know, Christy, wouldn't you say that that, it, that came from your earlier comments wouldn't you say it really depends on, on the originality of the materials that you're dealing with? And we, had a, we have a building that is uh, late 18th century and it has not been touched. Uh, it, it is if the family just walked out the door and it's a great study on how a building changes over that time period up to about 1960. And we've done very little in, in terms of, we haven't done any rest, what you would call restoration. But the exterior of the building was so deteriorated that we in fact had to replace 90% uh, of the collaborators. So that would be what I would call daily maintenance kinds of things. Um, and, we, in, and that was in effect a restoration, but um, we, it was really day-to-day -day, uh, protection of, of the building. We have a note, someone from the National Trust is with us and they wanted to let our, um, attendees know that they're happy to have folks contact the National Trust um, that have historic sites with questions about their own collections policies or deaccessioning processes. Um, they've been tracking down case studies from their own use of funds for direct care of objects, historic buildings and landscapes since they made their changes to their collections policy. And the AAM direct care matrix has been instrumental in helping their collections committee as well. So uh, thank you for uh, that offer and, and happy to, uh, uh, to know that the National Trust is it's wanting to be a, a resource to so many folks that are on today's discussion. I put links in, Scott, to the chat for their, uh, their policies and some great, great articles. And I think that they've really, thanks again, National Trust, I'm not sure who, but um, Tom Mays and Kathleen Malone France did um, a wonderful job, good articles in both uh, history, uh, in both form, the National Trust pu um, publication, but also in ASLH, and I put those in the chat 
um, but they're great, great resources. And I think that that really kind of turned around uh, a lot of people's thinking when they came out saying that their buildings and landscapes are the museum collection. That's the name of the article. Um, and that the primary criteria for inclusion is that these are the historic structures or landscape feature must provide active public benefit by being accessible to and interpreted for the public. I think that that's uh, really, really key. Um, there were, you know, and when this came out in the field, there was not really, you know, a stir. I think a lot of us have been acting on those lines anyway, but thanks to the trust for putting that down in paper and getting those policies out there so that we, uh, we in the field can use them as models. I think this question is made for both Larry and, and Ken here in regards to some of the earlier conversation we had, wanting to know when your institutions deaccessioned your historic buildings, what was the public response and how did you handle messaging about the decision to deaccession? That's an important one. And uh, we, <laughs> we got caught in one case. Uh, we were pretty straightforward about and, and placed articles in the local newspaper and actually had one sitting in at someone's computer that hadn't gone to the newspaper. And the newspaper picked it up and the headline was something about Strawberry Bank deaccessions building to pay oil bill, uh, something along that without checking with the institution. So we had to backtrack a bit on that one um, to make sure the public understood that that in fact, we weren't going to be paying the oil bill. The house is being deaccessioned because someone could take better care of it than we and that money would be used. Uh, well, actually in that particular case, the money went into the endowment. But one of the earlier, one of the first houses we did of the three, we just did three. The first house, we actually had a member of the family that contributed the house it was one of the houses that had been moved to the property across the street from the property. We had a family member that actually uh, did a testimonial in the newspaper about how supportive the family was in, of the house being sold and, and the easements being put on it. So that helped, but you really need to be really careful because it's easy to get that misconstrued wire deaccessioning things. Ken, how about historic New England in, in publicity and, and, and discussing this with the public? I mean, we, we use this word a lot. I mean, it, it is, you have to be totally transparent about, about it. When we did our, um, I'll say, large deaccessioning that formed our uh, easement program well before my time, um, I know that a lot of people were upset. Um, I know. And we lost some members, and that's the reality, and it's going to happen. Um, we just last year deaccessioned a property, um, and um, I think that uh, it started under our uh, past president Carl Nold and was finished this year. Um, and it's it's on our website. We were very um, public about it. Um, I think you just really want to be upfront. Yeah. why you're doing this. And I think the fact that like Larry did at Strawberry Bank and let, what we just did with the house that we deaccessioned, we put the preservation easements on it. So ultimately it's a story of this property will be preserved, both the landscape, this is the, the house that we just deaccessioned was on the ocean um, and beautiful location, but the grounds will not be developed. Um, the building will be preserved um in perpetuity so you know it's i think being truthful why you're doing these things um and you know it's all about sustainability in my mind you know if, if these properties aren't going to be able to what are you gonna what are you gonna do scott you know instances in connecticut where you know people sued the local historical society because of the care of a building it wasn't being kept up um, we don't want to be poor stewards. This helps us do our job and care for um, the, the majority of our properties that we can. The ones that we can't, we deaccession, we make sure that there are easements and they're taken care of by private owners who get to enjoy them. They still, you know, they're, they're being lifted and they're being used. That was the original purpose. Good. It's a win-win. 
when 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 you de when you deaccession a building and you put easements on it, I think you're fulfilling, from my point of view, you're fulfilling your ethical, moral responsibility to the person who gave that house to you originally or how you obtained the house. I think it's important to remember that. We have, uh, well, we're, we're all either current or former ASLH board members on this, this uh, chat today, but uh, another current ASLH board member, Trevor Jones uh, from History Nebraska has, has written that if anyone wants to talk in detail about tiered collections, they can feel free to reach out to Trevor. So thank you, Trevor, for, for that offer here. And, and, and thanks for joining our session today. Um, we have just about seven minutes left. And I know we're getting a couple more questions that are coming in, um, but I wanna give each of you an opportunity to, if there's something we haven't talked about that you wanna talk about with, with our guests as well um, to, to do so or some final thoughts and words and advice to folks. So um, Christy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to you first because we've been had Ken and, and Larry talking a lot recently here. So other thoughts that you wanna leave with our, our audience of probably many historic houses, very small, all volunteer organizations. It's a whole different world than the big art museums with big mega donors and big mega bucks. Uh, what kind of other thoughts and, and uh, final uh, comments do you wanna leave to this audience today? Yeah, I, I simply would say that you have to, um, in addition to holding on to sort of industry standards around those things, I think you also have to be very mindful about what those resources are when you are that small or local um, historical society and what does that mean for you. I think, frankly, in those cases of the historical society, it's one thing to have a historical society listing, but I don't personally think it's a good idea to accession that building that you're operating from. Um, and I simply say that because it gives you more options uh, mm -hmm. when the time comes about maintenance, preservation, and care um, so that you are able to do what is appropriate for your community um, and for your structure in a way that accessioning may limit you. And I'm going to ask you for your final thought, but I'm going to tie it into a question that's just come in here because uh, I think this ties into the deaccessioning of that house in, in, in New Hampshire you were talking about. What do you do when things have been accessioned, including old light bulbs and slip covers, everything that got, was in the house got accessioned. What do you do about the stuff once you've deaccessioned to the light bulbs that you no longer lead? Can you just give them away? So final thoughts and what to do about when you've deaccessioned light bulbs, motor oil, and you know cat food. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> um, well, final thoughts about deaccessioning are that um, you have to have your policies in order. Um, I think that that's very, very clear. You need to decide what direct care means for your organization using what ASLH and AAM uh, provides for you. But ultimately, you define that policy. And then when you're doing any deaccessioning, I think transparency um, and following through on what's ever in your policy. Um, what, to, what to do <laughs> with with that stuff. Um, honestly, you know, Scott, there's there, there's someone who wants anything. And as Scott has been to my house and sees, <laughs> uh, knows, um, uh, I think there are people out there who would want that material, <laughs> no matter what it is. So you just have to find it. I'm, I, I know of cases where things have been, you know, have, it's okay with certain things to throw them out. I'm not a curator, don't anyone shoot me. Um, but a broken light bulb, yeah, I would. Yeah, I think if you've, if you've deaccessioned it and you've tried to find a home for it and you've got no homes, Goodwill or a trash can at that point in time for the light bulbs that remain are, 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 are fine. You've, you've, got, you've done your due diligence. Right. Um, Larry, final thoughts and, and, and messages for the audience. Sure, I, I just want to think one of the most appropriate and important things that we said today is that word appropriate that Christy used. I think every organization has, it has to be appropriate to the organization, what you're doing. And that gives, gives some fairly significant leeway while you're still keeping in mind what the, uh, what the guidelines are from, from our field. Uh, and from our profession, but I think it really has to be uh, what works for that particular institution. Well, we are just out of time here. So I want to thank Christy, Larry, 
and Ken so much for being a part of this panel session. A uh, fabulous, fabulous discussion. I know we could keep going for another another hour. I want to thank uh, Alex for for helping with all the questions today, um, and I want to thank Emily and everyone at Syracuse for inviting us to be a part of this two day symposium. Um, and I will turn it back over to Emily for some final housekeeping. Thank you so much, Scott, and to the panelists. Um, I love the the concept, Scott, that you said right at the end about due diligence, and that that is really um, you know kind of our our role. Um, and I was also chuckling to myself. I have. Uh, uh, I hope it's only one. It might be more than one squirrel that has decided to take up residence in my attic that definitely needs some aggressive deaccessioning um, <laughs> from the contents of my house. Um, but thank you everybody who attended. Um, we'll have a brief break now. Um, it is coming up on 1 p.m. Um, but we hope you will join us um, for another one of the highlights of these uh, two days, which is Christopher Bedford's uh, keynote address. And so yes, that will be at 1.30. And uh, the link, as always, is in your program. So we hope to see you there. And thank you so much for attending. Thank you.